quick, with blood spilt, though thankfully just of the political variety. A power grab of monumental proportions today when number 10 gobbled up its treasury neighbours. It's not that long ago that Sajid Javid was driven through these gates. He stopped at the security barriers there to allow him to walk into number 10, the sort of treatment given to ministers who are about to be reappointed. But we've just learnt that the Chancellor has resigned after a major power struggle with number 10 over his special advisers. Rule number one in British politics is if a Prime Minister and a Chancellor have a falling out, that spells major danger for the government as a whole. Ben Wallace. Uh, hello, I'm well. A happy day for you, but not so happy for Sajid Javid. Uh, Sajid is a great colleague, he's a fantastic Home Secretary when I worked for him, and he uh, was a, a very good Chancellor, but the Prime Minister has a right to organise his team his way, and you know we've got to set the government up for the 21st century and move forward. But it looks like he was he was given an offer that uh, he had to refuse, which is essentially I, 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 sign up to a new joint unit. And by the way, all your advisers are sacked. I, I, I don't know. I've been I've been in Brussels and NATO, so I've been on the Eurostar. So I think yeah, you know you really need to find out the detail for someone else. Good afternoon. Why do you resign, Mr. Javid? Was Dominic Cummings forced you out? Back home earlier than expected after rejecting new terms of employment. They were to sign up to a new joint number 10 and Treasury economic unit. Oh, and by the way, all your advisers are sacked. That left Sajid Javid with no choice. The conditions that were attached uh, was a requirement that I replace all my political advisers. You know, these are people that have worked incredibly hard on behalf of not just the government, but the whole country, done a fantastic job. I was unable to accept those conditions. I don't believe any self-respected minister would accept such conditions. And so therefore, I felt the best thing to do was to go. A victim of an operation with shades of the mafia, part personal and part business. The Don and his conciliary, Dominic Cummings, were willing to tolerate, if not exactly celebrate, Sajid Javid's presence in Cabinet. But they wanted to knock him down to size, believing that his instincts as a fiscal hawk might complicate their spending plans aimed at new Northern Tory seats. And so an offer was made, knowing that acceptance would deliver a supplicant, whilst refusal would create a vacancy. And the beneficiary was the youngest chancellor since the war. There's one clear winner today. A prime minister with a large personal mandate has succeeded where many predecessors have tried and failed, taking control of the two power bases in this street. Ultimately, though, power still resides in the Treasury all the way down there. And whatever number 10 may think, a wily chancellor can still wield those levers of power. After the political bloodshed, time to return to the more mundane rituals of a reshuffle with a distinctively British note. I think the weather is a bit worse today than it was this morning. It's begun to drizzle again. Are you sad to have seen Sajid Javid go? There were less well-known faces with a new party chair. Calm after a turbulent day, with number 10 now in complete command. But even the most powerful of prime ministers can discover they need all the friends they can muster. Nick Watt is here with me now. Nick, what's the reaction been then? Well, the view in number 10 is that this was absolutely not about taking out Sajid Javid, but it was about removing his advisers. They believed that they were guilty of leaking a series of unhelpful bits of information, sort of preparing the ground by saying that Sajid Javid supported HS2, and then they were really annoyed when there was a suggestion that number 10 was pushing for a mansion tax. Now, number 10 says that the changes today were actually relatively innocent. What they wanted to do was recreate the atmosphere, the operation you had of all places under David Cameron and George Osborne, which was a seamless number 10 and number 11 operation. That is not how the Sajid Javid camp see it. I, uh, I spoke to one of his best friends who says, by targeting his trusted advisers, what else could he do? Of course he had to go. Another one said, number 10 doesn't like the Treasury. The Treasury is powerful, so let us cut it down to size. Uh, but another friend of Sajid Javid said uh, he called their bluff, didn't he do well? There's also been reports of late that Dominic Cummings, the senior advisor to the Prime Minister, had been perhaps losing his grip on power. 
Uh, what does this mean today? Well, Dominic Cummings was not in the meeting today between the Prime Minister and Sajid Javid, but he was absolutely behind these changes because he believes that you need to tighten the control of the centre. What he wants to do is, is avoid what he regards as the drift of the Theresa May years, and also saying, look, this is the post-election reshuffle. The Prime Minister has political capital. Now is the time for him to spend it. As you say, lots of speculation about Dominic Cummings losing his influence, lost on HS2, lost on the the idea of shrinking the cabinet turns out that he has carried out orchestrated the most important reconfiguring in a generation of the relationship between the prime minister and the chancellor in favor of the prime minister and just think of this over the last 30 years what would have happened if the prime minister had been in complete and utter control who knows maybe tony blair would have got us into the euro what a thought. There you go. Nick Watt, thank you very much for that. We asked the government to come on the programme to discuss the reshuffle and its implications, but no one was available. I'm joined now in the studio by former Chancellor, former Chancellor excuse me, of the Exchequer under John Major, Lord Lamont, and down the line from Hertfordshire by former Justice Secretary David Gork, who's of course worked alongside Sajid Javid in Theresa May's and David Cameron's cabinets. Welcome to you both. If I come to you first, uh, David, Sajid Javid, incredibly ambitious, he wanted this job, yet he didn't even get to deliver a budget. Should we be alarmed by such an ambitious man feeling like he had to quit? Well, I think it's obviously a very difficult decision for someone as ambitious as, as, as Sajid to walk away, but I really think he had no choice. I think he made the right decision. He was you know, faced with an offer that he couldn't accept. And uh, in those circumstances, I think he did the, the, the right thing. And I think it is concerning if the position of the Treasury is going to be significantly weakened, because I think we do need a strong Treasury. It is the Treasury that is there to stand up and protect the interests of the taxpayer, ensuring that what government does is affordable and that value for money is uh, found. And if the Treasury is not able to perform that function, then government becomes unbalanced and in the end there's likely to be a significant cost for all of us. And yet, I mean, of course, people would expect you to say that. You were removed from the Conservatives for being disloyal. I don't think it's any secret that you're not a fan of Dominic Cummings, uh, of course, being described by some as a, an unelected advisor, which Brexit was, of course, meant to do away with in the UK. Uh, why isn't this just a sign of Boris Johnson exerting his total control like he should as the Prime Minister? Well, I think I should acknowledge that in terms of the acquisition of power, the Boris Johnson-Dominic Cummings combination has been remarkably successful and they are uh, accumulating a huge amount of power. But in terms of delivering good government, actually you do need strong departments that understand their responsibilities. You do need strong cabinet ministers who bring something to the table, including some independence. And I think you do need that institutional strength of the Treasury to ensure that the taxpayers' interests are protected. And as I say, if we start taking away the checks and balances in our governmental system, then there will be a price to pay for that in the end. And that is something that we will, we, we will regret. Seeing as most of our viewers don't know Dominic Cummings, how, how would you describe him? Well, I confess I don't know him particularly well myself. I've only met him briefly a couple of times. But evidently, he is very driven. He is very determined. Uh, strategically, he clearly has a coherent approach. Um, but I think he, he's someone who is very ruthless in ensuring that there is nothing that stands in his way. There aren't the constraints to decisions being made. Now, some people will find that refreshing and some people always like a strong leader who just gets on and does what they want to do. But we live in a complex society where there are difficult decisions that have to be made, where the repercussions of those decisions can be complicated and far reaching and that you cannot run a successful 21st century government on the basis of a very small group of people making decisions uh, in a vacuum without institutions around them and without checks and balances. David Gork, thank you for that. Let's just bring in Lord Lamont now. 
If you were Chancellor today and you'd been given this offer to get rid of all of your advisers, would you have walked? I think it would be very difficult for anyone to have accepted that. I think the relationship between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor is the most important relationship in a government. The Chancellor, because he has to control spending, is always in a minority. Everybody else wants to spend money. The, the Chancellor can only operate effectively with the backing of the Prime Minister. At the same time, you have to have a Chancellor who has a certain degree of independence and who can speak candidly to the Prime Minister as well. That has to be accepted by the, the, the Prime Minister. So I understand possibly what the Prime Minister was trying to achieve, making, as uh, Nick Watt said, making sure that perhaps the relationship was the same as between David Cameron and George Osborne. But the way it has happened, I think, gives the impression that this is seeking to control the Treasury and dictate to it and run it from number 10. And that is doomed to failure. Doomed to failure, although you could argue, like you were just saying, that relationship should be as good as possible. For people who are thinking, do you know what, OK, the Chancellor changed roles today, the person changed, why should I care? You've obviously held that position. Why should people care in the way that it was done, in the manner that it was done? Well, it's not so much the manner, it is the balance between the two. Why should the Prime Minister suddenly decide that he wants to control the Treasury in a way that he doesn't control the National Health Service or the Department of Transport? Why should there only be one set of uh, political advisers, both to the Prime Minister and to the Treasury? The Chancellor, after all, has a department. He has the whole Treasury. What difference does it make if he has a couple of special advisers on top? I mean, this reeks to me slightly of uh, vulnerability, suspicion, paranoia. What was it like between you and John Major? Well, it had its ups and downs, but for much of the time it worked pretty well. Of course, I had differences with John Major, as everybody knows, but we both recognised that for the government to function, it was necessary for us both to agree, and there has to be give and take. David Gork, you've, you've made the journey to the backbenches and now out of politics. Sajid Javid could be quite a, a formidable enemy on the backbenches very early on in Boris Johnson's tenure. Yes, I think he could. Uh, I think he'll want to bide his time. Uh, but he would be a very effective voice on the backbenches. And if things uh, don't work out smoothly, I think he could be uh, quite a dangerous opponent. Um, and uh, let's face it, the, there aren't many other figures who could potentially be difficult on the backbenches anymore. Um, so that's something that, that obviously the Prime Minister will be wary of. But I, I completely agree with the remarks that, that Norman has made about the relationship between number 10 and number 11. I, I was part of the George Osborne Treasury team for, uh, well, for about 10 years. And the relationship between David Cameron and George Osborne was one pretty well of equals and they did work very closely together but you, you you were not going to try and replicate that if you have a chancellor that is put in a subordinate position David it Gork, won't work thank you for that lord demont final thought from you you said it reeks of paranoia this there is this sense of what we can grasp of of total control coming from a very small number of individuals around the prime minister obviously including the prime minister himself can you run a government like that long term no, I don't think you can, but I think there is a policy issue possibly behind this which will be in people's minds. And that is, Sajid Javid had laid down certain fiscal rules. Mm. Those fiscal rules were in the Conservative Party manifesto, whether the government find them and the Prime Minister finds them inconvenient or not today. And Sajid Javid had been fighting to retain those rules and this, of course, coincides with a government that is going uh, for a very, very big programme of public investment, investment in infrastructure, and there is also the suspicion it might have broken its rules on current spending as well. What Sajid Javid... Like suddenly the Conservatives found all the magic money trees out there. Exactly. And what Sajid Javid was trying to do was to retrieve the situation and the question that people will be asking in the next few weeks is 
are the government actually committed to fiscal restraint or not, fiscal responsibility? Of course interest rates are low, but the fact that interest rates are low isn't something anyone can guarantee will last forever. Are you worried by that? Do you recognise your own party? Uh, no, I am worried about this. And we are in a very unusual situation where interest rates worldwide have been delivered at a very, very low level. But that doesn't mean that public investment forever is going to cost zero. And we need to have restraint, we need to have rules, and we can't just have dis discretion or the whim of the government. And in that sense, I think Sajid Javid was fighting for the right answer. Lord Lamont, thank you very much for your time. And to you, David Bork.